Uh, welcome back for our, uh, our next panel. This, uh, the title of this panel presentation is Agents of Change for Inclusivity, How We Can All Play Our Part to Ensure a More Diverse and Inclusive Sector. Um, now, our panel uh, for this session is entirely online, so um, I'm, the only, uh, I'm the only person you're going to see briefly on stage uh, in person. Um, before I introduce the panel, let, we let me just remind everyone that we encourage everyone to enter your comments uh, and questions in the online platform, the events case platform. Um, and we also want to uh, strongly encourage everyone who is attending remotely to please don't be bashful. Please uh, go ahead and contribute your comments and questions as well. So our panel for today consists of Dr. Florence the Berge, who is the uh, panel moderator, and also uh, Dr. Katerina Bader, Dr. Yaz Osho and Dr. Ana Luisa Rosado Facho. And uh, we will welcome them to the virtual stage now and I'll turn it over to Dr. Thibersh. Thank you um, and uh, welcome to this uh, panel session. I hope you can all uh, hear me well. Uh, so my name is Florence Birch and I work at uh, Emerald Publishing, uh, a UK based academic publisher with a strong commitment uh, to equality, diversity, and inclusion, inclusivity, sorry. Uh, first, as a signatory of the joint commitment for action on inclusivity and diversity in publishing, and also the work we are doing uh, with the SDG Publisher Compact Fellows. As part of this commitment, we published last year the result of our second uh, global inclusivity survey, which shine a light on the challenges faced by um, academics regarding EDI in the workplace and their research. And these uh, results form the, the basis of our discussion today. So I will start with uh, my first question to, to the panel. Uh, which is more of a break the ice question and uh, asking them uh, to introduce themselves briefly and answering the question on, on what does inclusivity mean to them? Uh, so starting with Anna. Hello everyone. I'm Ana Luisa. I'm from Brazil. I am a non-indigenous researcher and I'm a lecturer in business department. And recently I got my PhD in management focusing on scaling social innovation impact in Amazon region. Uh, well, uh, about inclusivity. Uh, inclusivity is a wide concept, but with not simple correlations, because provide a huge opportunity for fair society, bringing different voices, aiming a new window of, of possibilities for all. Uh, that's why, in my opinion, inclusivity means equal opportunity for all groups and community, gives all voices and possibilities uh, for the uh, opportunities to be heard and understood, respect for all groups and people, and potential of inviting, embracing, and valuing different people. That's why living in a society, inclusive society, means everyone matters. Great, great answer. Um, yes. What, what does inclusivity mean to you after a brief introduction, uh, uh, your introduction to the audience? Okay, I'm Yaz Osho. I'm a senior lecturer in entrepreneurship and also a school EDI lead. I'm also a founder of two social organisations which aim to support um, minority entrepreneurs and also academics. So for me, inclusivity basically means no one is left behind you know if we think about it within an organizational context um we think about the practices the processes which means strategy policies and opportunities and also the operationalization of this strategy for me it's about the lived experience within the person in the workplace and the extent to which they actually feel valued and included so you know, for me, beyond inclusion, it's about considering the needs of all, enabling that everyone within the organisation and institution brings their whole self to work and gives them the chance to reach their full potential. So, you know, in terms of reaching their full potential, it then comes back to how that inclusion is operationalised within the organisation, because we all know that 
you know, since what happened with George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, for example, you know, that many organisations have refreshed their EDI policies, they've refreshed their commitments, but how inclusion is actually felt for the people within the organisation who perhaps are marginalised may be very different. So it's very important that inclusivity is not only about walking the talk, it means engaging all individuals in the organisation, understanding their needs and challenges, and what will make things better for them and acting upon that as well. Thank you. And finally, Cathy? Hi. Hello, my name is Kati Katarina Bader. I'm an Associate Professor of International Human Resource Management. And my research is around diversity and inclusion with a focus on gender equality in different country contexts. So I do a lot of comparative research on gender equality. I'm also an editor of the journal Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And I'm very happy to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation to this panel. Um, for me, inclusion or inclusivity is, is um, reflective of a very long journey, and I'm trying to keep it very brief because <laughs> I know I have no timing, but I think we need to understand it a bit in the context, in the historical context, and also in the shifts of conversation, because many of the comments that were made refer to the starting of it when like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when everything was about equal opportunities, about affirmative actions within organizations, the ideas of, of, of equal rights and justice as a means um, to avoid discrimination organizations, and then the term shifted more towards this idea of diversity. So we wanted to look at represent, uh, representation in, in organizations. And I think this term diversity put the business idea more at the center of the diversity discussion. So the business case for diversity was born at that time as well. So it's much about diverse customers. We need to understand them in order to um, develop products that meet the needs of these diverse products, but also diverse customers. But it's also diversity itself brings positive outcomes, so diverse teams are more creative and so forth. So it was all about increasing diversity, increasing numbers, increasing representativeness. But also there, at, at some point, organizations realized it's not really working. So many of you might be familiar with the terms glass ceiling or glass cliffs, so putting people into positions where they can't really succeed. Um, and also they still excluded from decision making. I think this was one of the core dis uh, core issues we, that, that my two predecessors uh, talked about. And I think this is also where this term inclusion or inclusiveness um, comes into place because it is about valuing differences, not just seeing differences and increasing the number, but really valuing those differences, learning from each other, allowing people to bring their whole self to work, to voice their opinions, um, and also to value the individual contributions. And I think in organizations, then, when we talk about improving inclusiveness or inclusion, it is about developing cultures that embrace fairness and embrace representation, but go beyond and understand diversity as a learning opportunity. Great. Great sound. Great introduction to, to the topic. Thank you. Um, so. Despite uh, the, the various efforts um, from uh, HEI's um, higher ed education organization to drive a fairer and more inclusive academic workplace, um, in, in the survey we conducted, this 20% of the respondents said that they did not see any real benefit arising from uh, those policies driving inclusiveness. Uh, in fact, some of them actually criticize the um, academia's EDI approach to, to branding it as uh, sometimes hypercritical and unfair, or um, they saw it actually anti-inclusive uh, at times uh, and damaging to research quality. So starting with, with you, um, Yaz, if uh, that's okay, to what extent do you, do you agree uh, or disagree with that, the, those comments on, on those um, EDI uh, approach by academia? I think for me, it, to a certain extent, um, but I'm, you know, the standpoint that I'm coming from really is an academic, frontline academic and an EDI lead within my institution. Um, you know, for me, work on EDI is everyone was, everyone's responsibility, but you will find that in a few, you know, in quite a few academic institutions, the work is largely undertaken by underrepresented groups such as racially minoritized academics, sometimes on an unofficial and unrecognized capacity. And this is something that I don't really agree with and I believe is unfair and needs to be addressed. Um, 
I can also kind of acknowledge that while um, some may criticise academia's EDI approach as being superficial in how it's operationalised, as there are more and more initiatives that are ring-fenced for groups that have, I suppose, traditionally or, you know, in, in, in the past been marginalised. You know, examples of this may be like, for example, you know, funds to tackle attainment gaps, research funds to tackle lack of research in underrepresented areas. And, you know, there's been recently quite a few funds related for related to BAME um, researchers. So some may see this as a shift um, and something being taken away or being shifted elsewhere, you know, so there will be a sense of, you know, why is this happening? Is it, is it something that's fair? You know, who is this benefiting exactly? It's not better, it's benefiting everybody, it's benefiting a minority, for example. You know, but having said that, I don't really, you know, I don't agree that academia's EDI approach and initiatives are wholly unfair because, and this is the main caveat here, it does depend upon how central those EDI initiatives are within the academic institution in question. So for example, if EDI is part of an institution's top priority in their strategic documents or objectives, or if it's more of a subsidiary focus or something that could be seen as performative, We've all been in organisations or gone to places where you have EDI events, you've got picture moments. If that's the only thing that's happening within the organisation, then you could say that it's kind of like hypocritical in a sense because there is no real change. So knowing people, for me, not as an EDI lead, knowing people that work in this space, we're, we're really passionate and very strong-willed people work, working very hard to... Um, you know, create more of a meaningful approach to EDI within our institutions. But in terms of seeing the benefits of EDIs, I think institutions really now have to be better at publicising the benefits and impacts of these initiatives for all within the institution. And one of the key things they can do here is like linking it to policy and strategy, you know, and also making it clear what the impacts of those events and initiatives are. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. This is one of the the the, the points that we raised uh, this this morning at the workshop on inclusiveness. Actually, um, Katie, would you would you like to add to what Yaz has just said? Yes, yes. So I found it a bit difficult to answer because it's a very broad statement and, and basically every institution approaches this a bit differently. I don't think there's a unified approach within higher education. Also, when we look at different countries, there will be different ways of, of how countries and like policy tackles these kind of issues. Um, but what I see is there are positive outcomes. We see more women published. We see more people of color published. We also see topics that, that are on the diversity agenda. So LGBT plus uh, topics that are published more. So it's not just the staff, but also the research agenda. I think that has changed. So there is progress. But on the other hand, I also see that that there's still quite a dominance of, of certain groups um, within publishing, which which makes it a bit difficult for more minority groups to really succeed because we know from research, if you're not part of the majority, if you don't have the networks, uh, you don't get the support, you don't get the uh, encouragement that you need. So it's, it's much harder to succeed. And so we do need some kind of supporting mechanisms. And I, I think most of us would agree that questions just to which extent um, we do this because we know it's a bit controversial. It can create backlash because we know if we support one a group that might be at the expense of another group. And so every kind of quota or preference for diverse candidates or diverse uh, uh, yeah, recruiting um, for different positions might have the consequence that other groups feel like um, left out. And I know Canada is a very extreme example where you have very strong quotas on, on diversity issues. And that might lead even to a point that certain applicants are discouraged to apply because they don't, yeah, they're not part of any of the diversity characteristics. And I understand that's very frustrating. And I even found kind of supporting uh, the initial conversation article that said that this is even corrupting science. So I understand that it's, it's a very controversial and a very hot topic uh, to discuss. But I think we might have to consider the other side as well. So we know that that biases do affect recruitment decisions. So the question is to which extent they have been fair in the past, to which extent they have been just um, in the past or even objective, however you want to refer to it. 
And I think even more important than this discussion is more looking forward because for me, representation is, is important as part of science because for me, science means a discourse. So it's in its es essence, it is a discourse of different viewpoints. And if we ex exclude certain viewpoints, I don't think we can really move science forward. Um, so we need that discourse of different viewpoints. So in short, I, I don't think it's damaging uh, research quality. I think the opposite, I think it might cause a bit of short term disruption um, at the moment, but in the longer term, having more diversity within uh, our community will improve the research quality. Great, thank you. Anna, do you want to add as an earlier career researcher yourself? Yeah, yes. Well, um, indigenous research in Brazil uh, are poorly represented in academia, not not just in Brazil, but I think uh, in the world. Uh, but we have seen uh, progress and advancing in this topic. So, the, uh, uh, including the new government in Brazil, uh, they create a new minister for indigenous people. So, I think we can see um, a progress. We can see a progress. Uh, in this topic and advancing in this topic because it's very interesting and important to talk uh, talk about and research about indigenous people, uh, traditional communities, uh, and minority groups related about these such topics. Thank you. Great. Um, so that brings me uh, well to the next. Um, question, unless there are any questions from the audience, but uh, if not, uh, the report also highlighted the uh, importance of diversity and inclusivity in the in the research design, right? Um, and taking the case of indigenous research, as you mentioned, Anna, 54% uh, 54 of indigenous and non-indigenous researchers said that there are challenges when conducting such type of research from access to funding to finding a journal willing to publish their work. Um, and the report also highlights some of the steps that both um, academia and publisher could do to address these, those challenges. Um, Anna, could you, could you give an example of uh, where you have seen those changes happening and, um, and how this might inspire others to follow suit? Uh, yes, uh, well, my PhD dissertation, um, in my PhD dissertation, I investigated two traditional communities in Amapai State. Uh, but before to talk about this, I would like to reflect about when diversity and inclusion in our research design are considered such as participants, research questions, the team, the project are more innovative, relevant and applicable. But uh, according to, a, I think it's a nature report, uh, indigenous research remains poorly represented in academia. Uh, and in my PhD dissertation, uh, as I told you, uh, I investigated the traditional communities in Amapai State in Brazil. Uh, and many traditional communities uh, can be found in Amazon region. Um, they are uh, 4.5 million traditional communities in Brazil, occupying 25% uh, of the Brazilian territory. Uh, and such communities live in a marginalized condition and they have suffered poverty, illness, land problems, discrimination, financial insecurity, uh, institutional instability, etc. And to conduce my research in such communities, it was necessary to obtain a prior and an informed consent. consent from local, local leadership. <laughs> it was a such challenge. Uh, this is made in an online meeting because my research was conducted in pandemic time. So I needed to write a letter uh, with my research intentions uh, to attend a meeting with the uh, leadership of the communities. Fortunately, <laughs> they voted yes, uh, agreeing with me conducing my research. Um, Talking about my research, uh, I explored the sustainability in Amazon region in Brazil and the importance of traditional practices as guardians of the forest. Um, UN report, uh, uh, traditional communities are the best guardians of the forest. And such communities have helped the preservation and maintenance of the biodiversity of thousands of years and constitute a vital source of knowledge and they are protector of the forest. 
uh, this statement got more stronger and practical when such communities, my community uh, where I give my research, decided to join in a social innovation called Pro -commun Community Protocol. Uh, this social innovation community protocol is a territorial management tool uh, based on a bottom-up approach. It's a participative and consultative process to empower the local community. Uh, and the community protocol allow the certification of acai berry. Acai berry is considered the black gold in Amazon region, especially in Brazil. Uh, and this certification uh, enables the responsible and sustainable man management of the acai berry stocks, maintaining the carbon levels and protecting the biodiversity. Uh, therefore, the conservation and preservation uh, is done with minimal impact for um, in order to maintain the sense of the forest. Uh, in addition, the community protocol enable these communities to overcome these vulnerability and social inequalities through strategic partnerships, governance practices, uh, and they create a cooperative of acai berry producers uh, called Amazon Buy. And this cooperative brought more control of the uh, acai berry um, supply chain uh, in these regions, rich new national markets, and now they uh, intend to export to United States uh, and Europe. Uh, so, to summarize, uh, in order to promote a fairer society and advancing in di diversity and inclusivity, the research design must include, uh, evolve, and consider traditional communities or other my minority groups. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Katie, you mentioned you you are uh, one of the uh, part of the editorial board of uh, the uh, EDI Journal at Emerald. And are there any example where um, we can promote? Um, you've seen changes in promoting inclusiveness in in, in taking account the research design in inclusiveness and and finding a home a journal to publish in. Yeah, I mean, it's first of all, having a journal that is dedicated um, to these kind of topics helps uh, to kind of get these topics promoted. It is also bringing different topics on the research agenda. Um, kind of, um, it is about finding people who represent these communities who can then basically edit them, help them develop the paper and get them published in the end. Um, there's another example where I think that change has taken place, and I think that's a very deeply rooted, and it resonates nicely with what you said before, like about the indigenous community, because when I look at my own research, not just at the journal, but the research I do in terms of, of international business and international human resource management, um, there's this long-standing criticism that most of the research we do is very US-centered and um, kind of Europe-centered. And if we look at different countries, it's all from the perspective our multinational companies go to a country, they transfer the management practices, they look at how they can bring our way of, of doing business to different, uh, to different countries. And I think that, that that's something that's changing a lot, which I think is, is very important because A, there is a recognition that there's still an underlying mind set that somehow uh, causes the, these these kind of research designs but at the same time there's also more research invited about indigenous cultures indigenous practices looking at how multinational companies can benefit from them so it's all about reverse transfer reverse knowledge um, exchange um, kind of having this bi-directional exchange of practices so there's a change in the value of context, um, not as a barrier to implementation as it used to be. So looking at how can we reduce the barriers in these contexts, but rather saying this is a value per se, it becomes a value in itself and a resource for the multinational companies. So I think it's great to see that this um, again, agenda has changed. And, and also we see more calls for papers that look at these kind of questions that look at um, and also more papers from different countries across the globe and not just centered on what we would call the, the West, basically. So I think that's that's another good example of change. Thank you for that, Katie. I'll, I'll go to Yaz and then I'll take two questions from the audience. So I've seen, I've seen quite a, a bit in terms of like, for example, special issue journals as a guest editor for EDI, um, one of Emerald's journals, or our special issue, which is, um, you know, collecting submissions now, um, is based on exploring issues related to BAME, academic women working in global 
um, academia. And it's really enabled us to, as guest editors of colour, um, to bring a topic that is a very, very important to the front, forefront of a well-known and well-read um, journal. I've had really positive messages from the academic community because of this special issue, with quite a few people saying that it's well overdue. You know, this is just one of the steps that publishers can make. Um, there are quite a few other steps that they could make as well. So, for example, I've seen publishers, research organisations and magazines um, such as Research England, the Wellcome Trust, Times Higher Education Supplement that are moving towards targeting underrepresented groups or focusing on EDI issues through, for example, sponsorships, partnerships or ring fencing funding. Quite a few times I've seen this as part of um, their EDI strategy and priorities, which is absolutely key because it means that these are integral to the values of the organisation and its priorities. You know, my, me personally, I've been approached by quite a few organisations because of the organisations that I currently run to support um, underrepresented academics. And these organisations have been trying to diversify, um, you know, they've, they've tried to incorporate EDI into their strategies. And as part of that, they've asked for support with editorial boards, for example, special issue journals, um, as well as guest talks. So for me, um, more opportunities should be created. Um, and this can be done really, really meaningfully by co-creating these opportunities with the groups that these initiatives are aimed at supporting, really. Thank you. Yes, yes, I, I agree with you. And um, I think we have two questions from the audience. Um, and I, we have the first question from Ali Sinningham. Sorry, we can hear you. We we cannot hear you. Hello, there we go. Oh, that's it. Yep. Hi, I'm Alice Ellingham from Editorial Office. Um, so my question is, what do the panel feel about how we can address educational inequality, specifically for entry level jobs for publishing or for editorial staff, which may require a degree, even when subject or field content is not a job requirement? Until we have full equality in university attendance, doesn't this also prevent a fully inclusive sector? Thank you, Alice. Who, who wants to address this question first? Katie? Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with the context of, of the sector itself, so there might be a couple of things behind it um, that I'm not aware of, but I think generally it is about creating awareness about that certain jobs exist. Um, there might be alternative ways of, of getting education. There are degree apprenticeships where, where less um, economic investment is, is um, required if you have a company that sponsors um, the education of uh, those younger people within um, that sector that might be then help to kind of fill that recruitment gap. Yes, yeah. Um, yes, or Anna, do you want to add anything to this uh, answer? Um, I think it, it, it's about disrupting, you know, the whole, the whole field, you know, if, you know, having a degree it is cause it could be causing a barrier to some people getting into the field, then it's disrupt, it's about disruption. It's about thinking, okay, so how else can these particular groups of people access the skills that they need in order to, to do the role? And um, as Kathy said, there are other ways. Um, and, you know, even creating um, opportunities within the role itself to enskill the people that don't have the degree program, you know, on the job training, for example, job enlargement, there are, there are, there are more ways around it beyond um, a conventional degree. Yeah, I think my point was rather disrupting the publishers to not request it rather than ensuring that people got a degree. That wasn't, ah, that was kind of the okay. other way I was thinking is that they shouldn't, if you don't need that field content knowledge to do the job, why are a lot of entry level jobs still requiring a degree? 
Yeah, I think we have a similar issue at, at university when we look at master's programs, for example, we often would require a first degree to start those those programs. And we as a university, we have also we have started to kind of find alternative ways. So how can we accredit for professional experience to kind of to, to which extent we can then say this equals a, a, a a bachelor's degree or this equals some kind of, of qualification um, in order to make sure that we don't disadvantage people who might not have had the opportunity to have this first degree. But very, very interesting question. So I, th I think the disruption really is about understanding this difference, but what is a formalized degree and what is knowledge somebody has created or gained or skills that somebody has gained and, and, and developed through their prior work. Thank you, Katie. I think we have a uh, next question um, uh, from Ed Gerstner. Sorry if I missed your nope, name. No, perfect. Uh, Ed Gerstner from, uh, I'm Director of Research Environmental Alliances at Springer Nature. And I think that answer might have answered my question to some degree. So I would, I would really love, and I know the Chief Editor of Nature feels the same way, love to see more representation of indi indigenous knowledge and indigenous knowledge producers within the pages of nature and indeed within the pages of everything that Springer Nature publishes. But I, but I wanna start with the initial question is, are we even fit for purpose? Are, are, are the, 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 the types that we publish, the way that we publish, the way that we review, is that fit for purpose for the needs of indigenous knowledge producers and for indigenous knowledge? And similarly, is the, is the academy fit for purpose for representing the needs of these knowledge producers? So I think we do need to talk about barriers to entry, but we also need to talk about, well, what's the relevant of, relevance of them entering in the first place? And are the structures, do the structures exist that enable that knowledge to be realized fully? Thank you, Ed. Anna, do you want to address this question? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Yes, we need to create more opportunities, raise the awareness about this. Uh, but I think, it's, yes, I agree there is a barrier uh, in this type of uh, uh, topic, especially in, um, uh, in uh, countries of, uh, uh, as Brazil. We have lots of difficult to um, assess data to uh, assess funding uh, and these types of uh, uh, this kind of situation it's happened in brazil not of course uh, in, all, in other countries but in brazil is very uh, 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 difficult to assess data and the questions and the team and participants so um, we need to create more awareness and to invite more people special issues uh, develop a conscience, conscience about this, and I think it. I think it is. Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, so uh, Katie, you want to add to it? Yeah, I think there are two aspects to it. One is the question: How, do, how can we motivate people to do this kind of research? And the other one is: How do we get it published? And I think the first one is a difficult one because I know from my, myself being an academic, having an academic career, in the end, it's all about the publications you get, the funding you get. And if you do research on a topic that is harder to publish, that is harder to get uh, income in, that often early career researchers would be discouraged to do it because they are told, wait until, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're tenured and you're a professor and then, then you can turn towards these topics. So I think having a realistic conversation about this. So what kind of field is it? How can you make a career in that field is important. Um, and the other way is, and that builds on what has been said before, is increasing representation in editorial positions, in call for papers, in, and it's not just, just the call for papers, it's also who, where do all the editor, like paper development sessions take place, um, which topics do they cover and so forth. So to make sure that all these, all the activities um, help researchers in that area to actually get their things published. Thank you. Yes, or anything to add? Or we have only three minutes left. Perhaps I will, if you don't have anything, I can move to the last question to answer briefly. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah? 
Okay. So the last question is, um, what can publishers learn from diversity research to improve inclusiveness within and beyond academia? Starting with you, Katie. So you said we have two minutes, right? <laughs> I try to keep it very brief. I think most of the things have been said, and I think there are two aspects that I think are very important. One is diversity in key positions. We know from research, if the top doesn't commit to diversity and inclusion, then all the initiatives in an organization basically fail or are window dressing. So it is about commitment at the top. And in our area, that means in editorial positions, in positions that publish papers, that decide about careers and so forth. Um, the other, other side is outreach and encouragement. We also know that minority groups often self-reject or don't apply for positions. They might not submit um, their paper. So there's more encouragement, more support needed. That starts with, I mentioned it before, paper development sessions, meet the editor sessions in underrepresented countries, offering virtual um, ways of attending conferences because of economic or care reasons people might not be able to attend um, a, a, a conference in person using different channels to communicate. So we have these standard listservs that we think everybody re reaches everybody. But if you look at certain countries, people might not be aware of those. There might be other communication channels where the call for papers should go out, where the call for editors, uh, editorial positions and so forth should go up, um, should go out. So to just make sure um, that they reach um, those groups as well. So I think we've, we, we've started doing the right things. It's just doing a bit more and uh, with more persistence. Sorry, do you hear me, Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, I think first and foremost, whatever publishers do to improve inclusiveness should not be done in isolation for those who they wish to help. So, for example, initiatives should be very much based on consultation through advisory board, user-led, um, created um, initiatives. And I don't believe that research from uh, sorry, underrepresented groups should be peripheral, not just in special issues, for example. Yeah, it's a great start, but it's about getting these opportunities in front of um, underrepresented groups, as um, Kathy mentioned, such as black academics, for instance, running how to get published sessions with university networks, finding out how to access harder to reach academics who are underrepresented, for instance. And finally, Anna, do you want to add anything to Yes, sir. No, no, it's fine. It's all good. Um, so I think we are reaching the end of the session um, where I'm going to send the panel uh, for um, their insight uh, into the topic of how we can create a more diverse and inclusive sector. And um, I'll add the audience. And if there are any questions, or um, that's it for now. Do you everyone, uh, everyone please join me in thanking this excellent panel. Thanks so much to all of you. We appreciate you coming from such great distances to join us today. Um, and I will now dismiss everyone to go to their various workshops. We have got our second workshop session next. So we'll see you back here in an hour.